We have a lot going on in the Russia-Ukraine war. To help me understand and explain some of these big events to you, I have former CIA Larry Johnson. Larry, thank you so much for coming on. Always a pleasure, Stephen. So uh, the Russia-Ukraine war continues to move forward. Um, just this morning, President Biden and the White House announced that they would like House Speaker Mike Johnson and other top Republicans to sit down with them to discuss passing the $60 billion of U.S. aid to Ukraine. Do you think uh, Speaker Johnson will be persuaded? And what kind of pressure will the president and the White House be putting on Republican leaders? No, I don't think he will be persuaded. I think the, the debacle at our own southern border is a, a, something that they've recognized as a real political issue. Most Americans uh, don't care about Ukraine. And despite all the attempts to portray Ukraine as some, uh, you know, burgeoning democracy and uh, bastion of freedom in the midst of an authoritarian, you know, threat, uh, it's just the opposite. You know, they've cracked down on political opponents, jailed political opponents, killed political opponents, gone after the church, shut down opposition media. And the election that's supposed to be held in March has been put on hold. Because Zelensky says, "Oh no, I'm in charge. I'm gonna. Uh, it's martial law. There's a there's a war on, so we can't have an election." Meanwhile, his popularity is it's actually lower than what Joe Biden's popularity is in the United States, which is pretty low. So uh, I, I don't think Johnson will su succumb to that. But even let's just say, okay, the Johnson caves and they uh, all cough up sixty one billion dollars. It's not going to change a thing on the ground in Ukraine. $61 billion, most of that's going to go to U.S. defense corporations. It's for that reason that I think Johnson may actually ultimately approve it, because it's money that will ultimately wind up in the campaign coffers of both Republicans and Democrats. But And the U.S. and these military industrial corporations that are tasked with uh, you know, producing artillery shells, maybe making new barrels for the 155 millimeter howitzer, uh, or, uh, you know, we're actually, we're not building new tanks. Uh, maybe try to build some more Patriot missile batteries, but again, those are lagging behind and are very expensive. But the money would go to produce those kinds of things. Well, it's going to take three, four, five, six, seven months uh, to produce that. And once it's produced and sent to Ukraine, who is going to use it? That's the thing that's beating Ukraine right now. They don't have a trained cadre of officers and uh, non-commissioned officer personnel that can command the troops. They're, they've been decimated. And each passing day, it's getting worse. Russia, this offensive that Russia launched and in, in taking of the EFCA, so quickly this last week, they're continuing to push all along that thousand kilometer front. And Ukraine, frankly, they don't know where the next blow is coming from. And it's not like they're sitting on a big fat reserve of troops that they can rush to fill this breach, rush to fill that breach. So the Russians have now, I, I believe the Russians actually have launched their major counteroffensive, if you want to call it that. Okay. So if I'm hearing you correctly, <clears throat> Uh, there there may be more pressure for American politicians to give money to the military industrial complex to stay in power than pressure to actually get money and resources to Zelensky. Correct. Correct. Yeah. There's even if you get the money to Zelensky, all all it's going to do is pad his bank accounts and that of his cronies. What uh, you know most of the expert commentators are ignoring is that when uh, Zelensky replaced General Zeluzhny a week ago, he didn't just replace Zeluzhny. He, he eliminated all of the officers below Zeluzhny that commanded different units and different uh, sectors of the military and replaced them with his own cronies. Well, you know, the, the military is not supposed to be a place where po politics and cronyism prevail. It's supposed to be based on competence. 
and scale. Uh, so that's one of the other reasons that you know, right now you're seeing Ukraine getting the Russians are just wiping the floor with them. Do you, do you think that <clears throat> Zelensky is still hopeful that Poland or Germany or France or the United States will send boots on the ground soldiers? Or do you think he's beyond that wishful thinking? Well, I think they already are. <clears throat> there are already foreign mercenaries who are actually U.S., the German, Polish military personnel, French military personnel that have ostensibly resigned, and put quotations among, around that, resigned from the their military duty, but have taken up arms on behalf of Ukraine. And so they're, they're the ones having to operate the HIMARS, what's left, to operate uh, some of the 155 millimeter batteries, the Patriot battery. Uh, one, there was a, a quick fleeting image uh, showing these uh, Ukrainian soldiers uh, fleeing from <clears throat> Navdievka. And real quick, you saw on the side of one helmet, the U.S. flag. So you had a U.S. soldier there on that front line running for his life. So the, you know, the, 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 the fact of the matter is that if the United States says, okay, we're not going to put up with this for one more minute, we're going to mobilize to arms, call all the, get our army together. We're going to go fight the Russians. Uh, I think the technical term is we'd get our ass kicked. We have, we live in a delusional world where we think we are militarily better than we are. Look right now. We cannot stop the Houthis from launching anti-ship missiles that are hitting ships and sinking them. In fact, they just hit a ship yesterday and they downed an mq9 predator drone so and enough with this invincibility of america's military power we have the most expensive military in the world but certainly don't have the most capable or competent uh, you, you probably saw this but vice president kamala harris spoke at the munich security conference <laughs> she yeah. said Russia's attack on Ukraine has been an utter failure for Russia. She said Russia has lost over 300,000 people and depleted their military stockpiles. Harris also said Russia is so beat down they ha that they have to dip into their prison system and force recruitment on their citizens to bolster the Russian Federation Army. What, what if this is true and how much of this is fantasy in order to drum up more money from Americans? Well, it's all fantasy, but let's figure out what is the right story. The week before we were told, oh, my God, Russia is so strong, so powerful. If, if they defeat Ukraine, they're going to sweep across Europe and crush Europe. Oh, OK. God almighty. Russia must be really good. But now it's, oh, no, no, no. Russia is getting, it, getting its rear end handed to it. I mean, they're getting devastated by the Ukrainian attacks. They're they got they're made up of nothing but conscripts, poorly trained troops that are just a bunch of criminals, rapists, burglars, and oh yeah, they're they, and they're having to use computer chips out of washing machines and refrigerators just to launch missiles. You know, Russia's teetering on the edge. Okay, stop. Which is it? It can't be both. Yeah. Either they are this juggernaut that's getting ready to sweep across Europe and crush Europe, or they are this group of keystone of lethal, malevolent keystone cops. Well, both are lies. Both are absolute lies, and it's uh, the, the, it's a sign of the West desperation and trying to come up with a propaganda angle that they can use to bamboozle the public and to blindly supporting going to war with Russia. So the reality is this. Uh, through all of 2023, the Russians were signing up new recruits. They were not going out to the streets, dragooning people. These were people who walked into recruitment offices, signed to either signed a contract or made a decision to join. They did it to the tune of 42000 a month. Do the math. That's almost a half a million last year alone. They're still they're continuing to recruit at that level. 
So let's just say she's right that, oh, since the start of this war, they've lost 315,000. Well, so they've added five, they've added a half million. And then uh, in uh, September of 22, uh, they added another 300,000. So that's 800,000 right there. So again, do the math. They got 515,000. Ukraine, it doesn't have that. Ukraine's average soldier, the average age is 43. And there, are, I can show you video after video after video of guys running people down in the street, tackling them, uh, grabbing them, uh, tr treating them like they're uh, fleeing felons, and then tossing them into the back of vehicles to send them uh, to a military recruitment center where they, you know, are given a uniform, given a gun, and then thrown to the front with no training. So, you know, Kamala Harris is a fool. She's an empty airhead. And she she doesn't even understand how she can say such ignorant things and be uh, be ridiculed for it. So, you know, the, let's just deal with the facts. Ukraine is retreating from Avdiivka. Ukraine does not have fixed wing aircraft to bomb Russian positions inside Russia or past the front line. Ukraine does not have a plethora of uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles and rockets or cruise missiles launched from aircraft to attack Russian positions. They have a few, but Russia shoots them down with its air. Most has shot down the vast majority with air defense. Ukraine claims falsely that it's always shooting down Russian missiles, and that's just not true. Uh, most of the Russian missiles get through because Ukraine does not have an effective, adequate air defense. So it's just, you know, as long as the West keeps up with this delusion, Russia is going to continue to roll along. That's why I think, you know, Russia right now uh, in some sectors have massed 70,000 troops and are going to be pressing forward with their offensive. Uh, I think it's very likely that by the end of March, they could be all the way to the Dnieper River all along the front. Yep. Ukraine would be in complete chaos. Because part of Ukraine's problem is they lack stable leadership. Yeah. Uh, so do we. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. That, absolutely. Absolutely. But, but do, do you think that uh, Kamala Harris has been briefed on this stuff or is she just swallowing the propaganda because somebody put these bullet points into her Germany speech? No, I think I think that's how she was briefed. That's what's shocking. I can show you um, uh, an article in Foreign Affairs written January 30th by William Burns, the CIA director, where he said some of the same stupid stuff. Now, Burns is not an uneducated man. Burns is not an airhead like Kamala Harris. Uh, Burns is actually, he, he was an accomplished person with, with a measure of intelligence. But for him to just, to, to make these kinds of claims that really have no foundation in reality is it, just, it's shocking. But you know, we, we saw it with Baghdad Bob, who worked for Saddam Hussein. There are no tanks in Baghdad. And then in the background, you see the U.S. tanks driving in. Yeah, the, these politicians can get out. They can deny that the sun rises in the east. Okay. Deny it. That doesn't change the reality. And the reality is this. Russia's defense industry is so far superior to anything in the West combined. Russia's defense industry is able to produce more tanks, more aircraft, combat aircraft, more artillery, more combat vehicles, uh, everything across the board, and more drones in particular, <clears throat> than the West combined. <clears throat> so Ukraine doesn't have a chance. There is no viable path forward for Ukraine to win. It doesn't have a map, a road to victory. All, of the, all it's staring is certain defeat. It's just a question of how many Ukrainians are needlessly going to die before they come to that realization. Is President Biden being <clears throat> briefed on this and choosing to ignore it, or is he being briefed with lies from Bill Burns and, and other security apparatus? Uh, it, it would appear he's being briefed with the lies, but he's sent the clear signal that he doesn't want to hear the truth. You know, that's part of the problem. 
<clears throat> um, if you know, you know how leadership is at the top of organizations. If a leader says to his uh, employees or to his uh, soldiers, look, I want to hear, if there's a problem, I want to know about it. And then if they say that, and someone comes forward with says, sir, you know, here's, here's this problem, here's what's going on, and then the leader punishes the person that comes forward informing about the problem, well, that sends a message, and everybody else says, okay, man, I'm shutting up zipping my lips, we're not going to say a thing. Alternatively, though, if somebody comes forward and they are embraced and protected, and then the, the leader acts on that information, well, then you get that open flow. Uh, what you've got going on with the Biden administration is a for, is the former. They don't want to hear the bad news. They don't want to acknowledge the bad news. They don't want to accept the fact that the United States had has a direct role in why this war has happened that U.S. actions over the course of the last 10 years have fed into this civil war in Ukraine and expanded it. So, uh, you know, the Russians have tried repeatedly to do negotiations, and at every step of the way, the United States has been an active player in sabotaging that. <clears throat> uh, I, I read today that uh, Russia's defense minister said that the in the in the regions of Kherson and Luhansk, where they put Moscow installed governors, that Ukraine has somehow been able to poison both of those governors. Uh, would would that have been uh, through Ukrainian spies, or would ha yeah, how would they yeah. have gotten access to the governors? It's real easy. I mean, these it, you know when you look at a Ukrainian and a Russian side by side, there's it's not like they got you know, some physical identifier that sets them off. Uh, they're genetically the same. And the language, it's easy to, uh, you know, the reality is most most Ukrainians, even at the start of this war, spoke Russian, not Ukrainian. Uh, Zelensky has been struggling to learn Ukrainian because he was born speaking Russian. So, yeah, that, that uh, the, the SBU is going to great lengths. And that's why... You know, I look at something like what happened to this uh, Alexei Navalny, this dissident uh, who, was, who allegedly was murdered by Vladimir Putin. Not at all. I think I think he was, you know, he got the Jeffrey Epstein treatment from somebody in the West. They found a way to pay off prison guards and uh, that. Or uh, he also had diabetes. So it wouldn't be unheard of for a 47 year old with poor diabetic care uh, to die. But the last thing that happened was that he was killed by Vladimir Putin because he was a threat. Are you kidding me? That would be like Joe Biden killing Marianne Williamson. And you go, who's Marianne Williamson? <laughs> well, she's one of these third party candidates that's running for the president. She's a, a goofy gal out of California. But that's the point. Most people have never heard of her. Most people don't know anything about her. And that's the same with like Alexei Navalny. You know, the vast majority of people ignore him because he's uh, irrelevant. Uh, he never got above 30% political support. And yet the West hypes that as, oh my God, he's an important player. Okay. In our own political system, if someone's just po you know polling at 30%, do we view them as a major political force? Oh, hell no. You know, we view them as like, you know, they're barely relevant. So yeah. a good, we just, an example we of have, that is Dean Phillips. Yeah. Who, who's that? <laughs> yeah. D Dean Phillips. He's, he's running, you know, for president. He's a Democrat. I actually think he's a, a really good guy. He's intelligent. He tells the truth. Biden's too old. Biden's losing his memory that then <clears throat> putting the country at risk. And right. does anyone that I know when I ask, do you know who Dean Phillips is? They say, never heard of him. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of the same thing there. Yeah, exactly the same. Uh, let's call Dean Phillips the Alexei Navalny of the United States. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Okay, um, I, I mean, this just goes to show that how the propaganda works against the American people. You know, so mm -hmm. for example, uh, CNN's headline was Ukraine's defeat in uh, Ad Avdiivka. Uh, Avdiivka. Avdiivka. 
Okay. Uh, that it's, it's damaging, but then they, the entire article is written about how damaging it's been to Russia. So it's like they, they tell the truth in the headline. They are, they've, they've lost the battle and they're giving up the territory. And then the entire article is about how damaging it was to Russia. I mean, is this a propaganda technique? Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, the, um, there was this, um, classified site where we did training when I was with CIA called site 39. I won't say where it was located, but they actually sold t-shirts, coffee mugs, and belt buckles that said, admit nothing, deny everything, make counter accusations. So that became sort of the CIA's model. Uh, that motto to, you know, don't admit the reality. Uh, uh, make counter accusations then and deny if if you know if they're saying that you did such and such deny it and it that's sort of the strategy you employ if you know you're a guy in bed with somebody else's wife and your wife walks in on you and discovers it and you get up and you deny no you're not seeing what what you think you're seeing you know no i'm not having an affair no we're not engaged with any kind of sexual relationship in fact what are you doing here you know, you start, you turn it around, you start accusing them. That's exactly what's being done with respect to Russia. Yeah. Now, are we talking about the Fonnie Willis case in Georgia? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, no, no, that's another, ex, that's another excellent example. You see the strategy, you see them, you see them do it all the time. It's done. It is done at every level from like Fannie Willis uh, all the way up to, uh, you know, our policy towards Ukraine. Yeah. I loved when they were like, uh, Mr. Wade, uh, did you use money from Fonnie Willis to rent a cabin so that you could go on vacation with her? Hmm. You know, I've rented a lot of cabins in my life. Like, come on, <laughs> dude. Like, what a, <laughs> yeah. what a great way to, to push that off. Um, yeah. Okay. Let, let's let's switch gears. Uh, you had mentioned to me, I don't know if you're allowed to talk about this or how much you can share, but uh, you you are hearing chatter through contacts at the CIA that Israel is planning to make a move on Lebanon in order yes. to yeah. stick it to, to Hezbollah. What, what can you share with us? When might this happen? So um, let's put the, let's create the right, the proper context. Uh, Hezbollah has been a presence in Lebanon for 40 years, going back to the 1980s. It, uh, it uh, was an organization that really came into being in the early 1980s and was one that targeted U.S. interests. You know, remember the attack on the Marine barracks in 1983? I guess that was like April. And then in October, there was an attack on the U.S. Embassy in Beirut, blew it up, killed some Americans and foreign nationals. So Hezbollah was involved early on in those attacks against the Americans and had a very close alliance uh, with Iran. Over the years, Hezbollah has become independent of Iran. It has a, a relationship, an alliance of sorts, but it's 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 its own actor now. And within that, Hezbollah is a it's a charitable organization, it's a political organization, it's a military organization, it's an educational organization, it sets up schools, it provides food, it provides social services, and its military capability has grown enormously. And Israel discovered this the hard way in 2006 when it uh, launched a, an invasion into southern Lebanon and basically uh, lost. They were stopped by Hezbollah. Uh, they lost a significant number of tanks, about 1,200 personnel, and so Israel withdrew. Now, over the ensuing years, over this last uh, 17, 18 years, there have been, Israel's been routinely launching aerial strikes with a fixed wing aircraft into Lebanon, and Hezbollah has been launching some rocket attacks into uh, Israel. But now this is this has really escalated over the past uh, two months. And uh, the word is, first, first you had the announcement in January by the head of the Israeli occupation force, General Halevi. Halevi said, 
yeah, we're going to be going into Lebanon. We're going to go into Lebanon and push them back. Because what happened right after October 7th, Hezbollah started bombarding the Israeli settlements along that northern border. They forced out over, I think, around a million people. So a million people had to flee south to get out of the rocket range. So Israel's looking to invade Lebanon and push the Hezbollah back north uh, across, the, I forget the name of the river, but they're using that river as sort of a line. Well, what they're, what they're forgetting is that Hezbollah now has missile capability that it can reach all the way down to the southern tip of Israel, an Eliyot. And uh, in fact, Nasrallah, the political leader of Hezbollah, made, made that claim in a speech on Friday, and I don't think he was uh, saying it idly. Uh, Iran just yesterday, uh, I think yesterday, day before, posted a mural uh, like a giant advertisement, and it's all these missiles, these intercontinental ballistic missiles that it has. And, and basically, uh, the message was, they're going to hit Israel and force all those settlers out of occupied Palestinian territory. Now, on the Israeli side, Mariv is a polling outfit. I guess it's sort of like their version of Gallup. Uh, they announced uh, the, the results Sunday, Sunday or Saturday, that 71% of the Israelis want an invasion of southern Lebanon. And then last uh, last night, I, one of my uh, uh, friends from the intelligence community is retired, but he's still in touch with people who know. And he said, uh, without a doubt, he's he's got it confirmed that Israel is going to invade southern Lebanon. And if they do that, uh, I think it will put the entire Israeli military force at risk, and it will certainly create really for the first time, mass casualty events among Israeli civilians, because Hezbollah will strike major Israeli cities with potent uh, missiles. So <clears throat> this, uh, <clears throat> this Middle East situation is not de-escalating. It, it's, hmm. it's on yeah. the verge of really escalating. Well, I'll just look what, uh, you know, I mentioned it earlier. The Houthis, you know, who are these supposedly third world backward people, uh, they shot down an MQ-9 Predator drone. That's a sophisticated drone. And then they uh, followed that up or in tandem with that act, they hit another uh, British ship. I don't know if it's a commercial or military vessel, doesn't matter. Uh, it's sinking. So all of these bombings, every other day we're hearing about, oh, the United States and Britain, they bombed this, they bombed that, they, you know. It's not making a dent. It doesn't change the strategic picture. If anything, it emboldens the Iraqis, I mean the Yemenis, to continue uh, operating. And there are reports that uh, Iranian uh, officers from the Revolutionary Guard are there on the ground consulting with and giving guidance and advice to uh, the Yemenis. Okay, final question. If if Israel makes a move on southern Lebanon, Hezbollah retaliates, which they most likely will, is is that enough then to pull in uh, other countries against Israel like we suspected might happen with Gaza? Or are they still going to sit on the sideline and, and let Israel and Lebanon just duke it out between the two of them? Uh, as long as Hezbollah is winning and has the advantage, I don't see any of the other Arab Muslim states intervening. Uh, what's more likely to happen is the United States would intervene. And if the United States intervenes, just as happened back in 1983, when Ronald Reagan thought it was a good idea for U.S. battleships to start bombarding Hezbollah positions in the Bakal Valley in Lebanon, Hezbollah struck back, killed a bunch of Marines at the Marine barracks uh, there in Beirut, and then a few months later blew up the U.S. embassy. Uh, and then the next uh, the next year they blew up the embassy annex. So, you know, the, the United States does not have the military power to defeat Hezbollah. That's simple. Well, let me we we don't we don't have the political will to pay the price 
that would be required to defeat Hezbollah. It would be enormously expensive, and it would lead the United States to suffering attacks on a whole variety of fronts that we haven't uh, previously endured. My, my understanding from speaking with Colonel McGregor and, and listening to Scott Ritter is um, that the strongest part of the U.S. Um, uh, armed services is our ability to move on the water. But wouldn't coming into the Mediterranean or, or the Red Sea, doesn't that put our battleships at great risk? Uh, yeah, well, well, yeah, our naval <clears throat> our naval capability has up until now been our major means for projecting force around the world. But now we're up against countries like Iran, which actually may have a hypersonic missile. If nothing else, they certainly have anti-ship missiles that uh, cannot e easily be defeated by the U.S. Uh, defense systems. So these carriers have to be kept away from areas of conflict where normally they would have entered you know, 20, 30 years ago. The, uh, the the Navy's got the problem as well with their understaffed. They, they, they're not meeting their recruitment goals. And they've lowered standards to bring people into the Navy. So not only getting uh, people of poor quality, but people that are not necessarily easy, you know, be going to be receptive to being properly trained and then be able to operate in these complex combat environments. So... Uh, and, and then we're watching what's unfolding in now in the Red Sea. The United States, despite its presence, has not been able to stop the Houthis. You know, it started on December uh, 10th, 12th, somewhere in there. Well, January 12th, February 12th, <clears throat> March 12th, uh, two, three weeks away. We're going to be three months in. And we can't stop what's a third rate military i mean the the country's impoverished but they've certainly shown that they can withstand uh the uh, u.s attacks without it degrading their capabilities to respond retaliate and i think americans ought to pay attention to that <clears throat> yeah the the drone warfare in ukraine and russia and uh the houthi it's all been very interesting to watch Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the United States southern borders being invaded mostly with military aged men. You know, most people think it's right. women and, and uh, young children. It's military aged men. They may have to force these people into the military uh, in order to build up their numbers, which is exactly what they say Russia is doing. Uh, yeah. so we kind of come full circle to our own propaganda. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. Uh, if you're looking for consistency, don't look to U.S. policy for that kind of guidance. Yeah. No, we're very well, inconsistent. Larry, thank you for coming on. If people want to continue to follow uh, your daily briefings on what's going on, is sonar21.com the best place to do that? That's the place. That takes you to all the other links If uh, on social media, whether it's Patreon, YouTube, Rumble, <clears throat> excuse me. So that's the site. Okay. I'll make sure to put that link down below. Thank you so much for coming on. Have a great rest of your day. All right, my friend. Thank you, Stephen.